Dzień dobry Państwu, Weronika gawińska broliki z Fundacji im. Janusza Kortyki. Mam zaszczyt zaprosić Państwa na spotkanie w ramach... Good projektu. morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is um, um, uh, Weronika Gawińska. Gryszet Ogen, and I would like to invite you uh, to the um, meeting, a second meeting of the Project Seeds of History to Zero Fields of Knowledge, organized by Janusz Kortyka Foundation and the Polish Educational Society in London. And the today's event is a Polish resident in the world, but I would like to welcome Marek Szymaniak, historian, deputy director of, for scientific affairs of the Second World War Museum in Gdańsk, member of the program board of the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation. Hello. And um, Dr. Elżbieta Barres, president of the board of the Polish Educational Society in London for many years, associated with the Polish diaspora education as a teacher and a school principal juror of the Being Polish competition. And uh, Dr. Damian Pepnowski, vice president of the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation. Good morning. The project Seeds of History to um, Zero 2.0 Knowledge Seeds of History is financed by the Chancellor of the Prime Minister as part of the Polish Diaspora and Pulse Abroad 2022 competition. Blogpress.pl is a media partner to this project. I would like to give the floor to Dr. Elżbieta Barres. Hello, everyone. I am very happy to be here with you yet again on a Saturday morning. I would like to welcome all of the Polish Deborah schools at this meeting. Today we have as many as 18 schools and the students are in different age groups and it's great pleasure for me to welcome you as I'm in Poland. It's wonderful here, blue sky warm and I'm very happy to be here and this lecture has been prepared in cooperation with the youngest Kurtyka Foundation, and we hope that it will be very useful in your projects, in your research, and in expanding your knowledge about Poland, which is the country of your parents and your country. So please um, uh, be open, and um, I would like to give uh, the floor back to the studio. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, before we uh, move on to the lectures, I would like to say a few words at the beginning, I'm very happy that yet again, the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation has an opportunity to host you at this session. And I'm very happy that the addressees or the target audience for the today's meeting are the students of uh, the Polish Deborah schools um, in the United Kingdom. And this is how we can bridge generations. And uh, I'm very happy to see that this uh, cooperation has been developing very well with the Polish Educational Society in London, headed by Dr. Elżbieta Baras. And the beginning of our cooperation goes back to the review the past and the future that was done in August this year. And this uh, cooperation is coordinated within the framework of a large international project um, that is um, run by the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation in, in Warsaw, Seeds of History uh, 2.0, Fields of Knowledge. And that is the project within the, uh, within the framework of which this uh, foundation networks and um, works together with uh, a multitude of the Polish diaspora organizations in the UK, US, Canada. And uh, we are looking forward to establishing cooperation with the Polonia organizations in Germany, Austria, Switzerland. And um, some paths have already uh, been developed uh, by us uh, in Austria. Therefore, this is a project that is um, very promising. And um, we have a possibility of um, uh, working together with the Polish diaspora organizations that uh, work with us, but also have an opportunity of working together with each other so as to become um, better engaged with the promotion of uh, knowledge about Polish history, which is fascinating. And Polish history is exceptional, is unique. And on the other hand, this is how we promote Polish historiography. And uh, basically, since the very beginning, once we started the shaping of uh, Polish historic science, Polish historiography 
has uh, always been in line with the Western European uh, tendencies as Western European um, historiography was outlining the development of um, historical sciences, but uh, also it's very much on par with the global historiography achievements. Therefore, there is nothing to be ashamed of. And um, the level of research that is um, conducted in Poland is very impressive indeed. Although there are some challenges and problems that are faced by our historians. And um, this is um, related to the way the result of our research is being perceived uh, abroad. And um, that is due to some exogenic factors that um, um, do not are not subject uh, to the researchers themselves. Those are systemic financial historical problems. Therefore, this um, project, Seeds of History, uh, has yet another facet as a project. The point is that the Foundation invites the Bologna organizations to distribute books that are published by the Foundation or co-published by the Foundation in cooperation with renowned scientific publishing houses abroad. Those are the books of uh, Polish researchers on history, on um, um, contemporary history that have been awarded by the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation an award, and uh, the award means that such a book is translated into uh, the Congress languages. Therefore, we translate uh, such books primarily into the English language, and those books are published by renowned Western publishing houses, and then they're distributed and promoted. And this is uh, exactly what we are inviting you to join as our Polish Polonia partners. And we include our partners very actively into that process of distribution and promotion. Yet another part of our work are meetings like the one that we participate in. We invite great experts, scientists and researchers who deal with various areas in the latest history of Poland to promote that knowledge using the current uh, research, the research that you find in Poland that is current in Polish historiography. It's very vibrant strain of uh, research, a very dynamic museum and academic institution is the Museum of the Second World War in Gdańsk. And let me once again uh, Welcome, Dr. Szymaniak. We work very vibrantly, very powerfully. Dr. Szymaniak is a member of our program council and he participates in the competition uh, works. We have Janusz Kurtyka competition and he uh, helps to choose the best uh, books in Polish historiography and to you, to our young friends and partners from the United Kingdom, and to all the people who watch this webinar, who participate in this webinar, I wish the best time and may it be intellectually fruitful. May I now ask Ms. President to take the floor? Or perhaps if we have technical problems, then we can uh, go to uh, the doctor. No, we have President Barras. Could you please provide an introduction? Thank you very much. We're very glad we will be cooperating. And we can perhaps now let our students start listening to the speeches. I believe it's time for Dr. Szymaniak to speak. Good morning. May I welcome you? I'm now smiling to the young people in Gdańsk who woke up today in the snow. And may I 
thank Kurtika Foundation for inviting me to this meeting with the young people in a subject that is highly fascinating. As uh, mentioned by Mr. Bimbnovsky, and it is a subject that contains a great dose of tragedy. 1944 and 1945, the moment when Poland, when the Polish military and civil uh, organizations were finishing their operation due to the decision taken after the Second World War. And that whole process did not end with achieving the goal that our heroic clandestine uh, workers made, put for themselves when they were joining the anti-Soviet, anti-German uh, clandestine underground operations. That was independent of them. Our soldiers, our clandestine state did everything they could. They were heroic in putting up the resistance and they did it from the first days of the Second World War. Nevertheless, the political decisions that were made in 1944 and 45, unfortunately, as I said before, did not allow them achieve the goal they intended. In 1945, unfortunately, Poland did not regain independence. Ladies and gentlemen, the beginnings of the Polish resistance, of the Polish underground movement, as I said a moment ago, date back to 1939. Furthermore, the very September 1939, that is the moment when the Second World War was only unflinching and this tragical theater of war or in occupied Poland was opening. The structures in which the Polish resistance operated, the Polish underground state, the fighting Poland, the Polska Walcząca were built from the last days of September 1939, from the time when it was known that Poland is facing the joint Soviet and German attack, that it cannot defend itself itself, I mean, because the alliances that Poland made before September 1939 proved unfortunately inefficient. And in 1939, in defending itself, Poland remained alone. The famous poster from the 1940s mentioned Poles who were fighting a lone war since September 39. It was the propaganda expression of that. That was the underground state, and that's very important from the point of view of the tale of the Polish resistance, because as part of the Polish underground state, that underground system of state authorities that operated in the territory occupied by the Germans and the Soviets, there were those two fundamental elements of Polish statehood that was never interrupted, that was never broken, even though there was no victory over the Germans and over the Soviets. The Polish underground state was the expression of continuation of the operation of Polish statehood, even under German occupation. I mentioned that as part of that system in Poland were two very important uh, divisions, the civil division and the armed division. Both had the government above them the Polish government operating first in Paris and then it was forced to move to the United Kingdom after France surrendered because the United Kingdom uh, withstood the German onslaught very bravely. There the Polish government in exile operated until the Second World War. That government originally under General Sikorski was uh, responsible for both the civil and the military divisions. 
the overarching task in the operation of the Polish underground state of Polska Walcząca next to the continuation of the fight for independence of homeland, which used any means, whether armed or not, was, and I really want to emphasize it, was the preparation as in 1939 and later it was envisaged to conduct a victorious uprising in Poland. That uprising was to follow the order of the Polish government in exile and to be conducted by those forces that were being built since September 1939 in Poland as part of the military department of the Polish underground state. Dear young people, this system of internal operation of the Polish underground state was almost, apart from the uh, occupation, those circumstances, it was just like a regularly operating state. There were all the agendas of a regularly operating state that would remain unoccupied. I think about the operation of clandestine uh, education, civil uh, administration, and then uh, the Polish armed forces, which were very developed structure, which were um, focused on propagandist information because Germans and Soviets during the Second World War uh, would disinform the Polish society about the current condition and that needed resistance against. The armed forces had special units that were ready for our saboteur actions and also for the guerrilla actions. They were also prepared and very well developed units for intelligence and counterintelligence. I'm not now discussing all the structures in the military and civilian administration, but I'd like to make you aware that the operation of the Polish underground state on the one hand was the expression of continuity of Polish state. There was no interruption at all after Poland yielded to the German Soviet aggression. And on the other hand, the operation of the Polish underground state was the expression of the war, of the struggle for independence that was conducted uninterruptedly. Let me emphasize the word independence because it is of profound significance when we speak about the goals and purposes of operation of Polish resistance under Soviet and German occupation. By the way, we are talking about that in 2022, not without a reason, because all the time we, for the decades, we have continued the same traditions of fighting for independence that were close to the heart of our our soldiers of our clandestine workers, of our resistance workers. Current generation, but also our parents, our mothers and fathers, our grandparents and the earlier generations, as well as those who will come after us, will continue the tradition, the tradition of independence, which has been in the hearts of our, our resistance people is important for us for the construction of our identity. The, this identity is the foundation of our existence, of our civic values. We do it for a purpose. We want to develop this independence identity within us. And that's a tradition that we elicit from what our predecessors, our forefathers had in their hearts. That was a bit of an aside, but I wanted to show to you a certain horizon of the tale that we're going to share here about the special actions of the Polish underground state in the structure of the Polish 
state. To wrap up what I've just discussed, the operation of the Polish underground state and the operation of this military arm, let me call it like that, beginning with 1939, these were the service to the victory of Poland, then the Union of Armed Fight, and then since February 42, the Home Army, which followed the Union of Armed Struggle in uh, all the actions against Germans and Soviets had its specific tangible goal, which was regaining independence by armed action, by intelligence and by information, and also by maintaining in the society the spirit of fighting Poland, of Poland continuing to fight. That's why this uh, name was interchangeably used. Underground Poland, you could say, but historically speaking, that name only was introduced in December 42. It was used in Polska Walcząca, published in London, but during the Second World War, it was rather the underground Poland, clandestine Poland, fighting Poland, and this tangible expression of that was the painting of a special symbol on the walls of occupied Polish uh, cities. This was a so-called anchor, that is the letter P, which on both sides had the arms of an anchor that looked like a W, that symbolized the letter W. PW standing for Polska Walcząca, the fighting Poland. The other thing that absolutely needs mentioning is that the operation of those armed structures had a particular expression in those forces to be united. The Home Army, beginning with 1942, other than running the saboteur uh, activity, was given the task to unite, as part of its structures, all the other military and armed formations. In the occupied Poland, there were plenty of those, and they operated in various uh, voivodeships in various regions occupied by Germans, and in the East also by Soviets and they all were to be unified in the home army. A very important dimension and a very specific characteristic of the Polish resistance during the Second World War, because, because this, this emphasize, let me emphasize it, this was a movement that was exceptional against all and any other movements like that in Europe or in the world. It is different by scale. In 1944, within the home army, we had more than 350,000 soldiers who had taken oath. Uh, to that, we need to add 10,000 officers. The second point, the Home Army was uh, taking armed struggle on the unprecedented scale if compared with other European countries. And although in other European countries, for instance, in Yugoslavia, the numbers, the underground army was even more numerous, but still as far as the scale of operations is concerned and the time of taking struggle, which is September 1939, makes Polish armed forces stand out that were operating under the structures, within the structures of the home was um, of constitutional and citizens character, that military service was voluntary service. This need to be underscored. Those were the people who were filled with will and eagerness to join the underground state structures, so to uh, join the branch of the armed forces, so as uh, to fight against the, the Germans and the Soviets. And also the fourth feature of uh, the Home Army was the diversity of forms of struggle exercised by them. And um, um, this uh, diversity was um, very much marked. Uh, and this is quite a long catalogue about the three most important forms of resistance, uh, armed operations, intelligence operations, and information campaigns. 
So those were three most important elements that um, were building up, um, were constituting the Polish resistance and the Polish struggle during World War II as they were operating within the structures of the Polish underground state. And the last point uh, within the framework of uh, this introduction, the Polish underground state that uh, had uh, both the uh, civilian arm and the armed forces, the military branch, the Polish underground state had one more, one more very important feature, namely, that was the state of those who wanted to feel being citizens of the Polish state, of the Polish underground state. So belonging, being part of the Polish underground state, it was not a given people, only those who could be the citizens of it, who were cooperating with the state, uh, adhering to its decisions, considered the Polish underground state to be a legal uh, state, um, as representing the Polish government in exile, but in the territory of Poland under the German occupation. So not all pre-war citizens of the Polish state were the citizens of the Polish underground states, as only those were the citizens of the Polish underground state who felt uh, the duty of cooperating with the Polish underground st uh, state structures and even a higher level of uh, being a citizen of the Polish underground state was um, joining the structures, the military structures um, of the Union of Armed Struggle. And um, I spoke about many different forms of struggle as exercised by the armed struggle. So let us, let us name them and um, specifically talking about. So let's talk about the if the, let us talk uh, about the, uh, the, the, the main command of the diversion, the so-called um, Kadev, um, that um, is um, the um, home army unit that conduct effective um, and passive sabotage and propaganda operations. And uh, those um, people who, and undoubtedly we, thinking about Colonel General uh, Fildorf, um, um, nickname, uh, the uh, code name uh, Neil. He was uh, the head of the CADF, that is uh, the General Command of Diver the, uh, Diver Sabotage Operations. And General Neil was uh, the person who was responsible for a number of um, sabotage actions against the German occupier. And he was uh, the one who was developing these uh, structures. He was uh, giving um, orders. And uh, basically speaking, he was the most important person who was um, um, deciding on the operations of the CADF. Now, what uh, was the main objective? Uh, Stefan Rubetsky, Rubetsky Grot, it's uh, the second name that is very important in this context. Uh, and um, he was uh, the head uh, and the chief commander of the home army. And in one of uh, his orders, he wrote that the objective of the CADF is uh, uh, to harden people so as to perform combat tasks and operations uh, within the scope of uh, the rising of a rising and also maintaining the combat uh, spirit within society so as uh, to maintain the um, atmosphere that uh, would uh, foster the uprising. So the objective of this command was uh, to carry out specific actions against the occupant or, or, or against the invader, but to show that the Polish underground state so was uh, fighting, and um, to show that uh, the, uh, uh, this is uh, how Poland uh, was. Uh, was um, fighting against the invader who was uh, uh, terrorizing the uh, Polish lands uh, starting with 1939. And also the home army soldiers were carrying out combat operations in many different areas. And I'm going to uh, speak uh, more about that, but also would like to talk about some other form of their struggle. 
that is uh, releasing political prisoners. The Germans were the invader, just like the Soviets, who, I'm losing sound, I, I, I apologize, uh, I'm losing the sound. The Germans uh, were not, uh, um, in fact, uh, um, adhering to any international conventions and within the framework of uh, operations, um, they were terrorizing the civilian population on a mass scale. They were murdering women and children, the defenseless people, but also they were mass murdering political activists. Um, and uh, the Germans were murdering those who were arrested and then were imprisoned um, in the torture cells of the Gestapo. And so the role of the home armor soldiers was to free political prisoners uh, and um, the most um, famous um, um, case was uh, that was the operation uh, from march 1943 during which uh, the uh, young uh, bitner officer uh, um, uh, uh, commissioned officer young hitman's and 20 other conspirators were freed who were being transported uh, from the Schuffer Street uh, um, uh, torture cell uh, to the Pavi prison. And uh, in March 1943, the Home Army soldiers were able to free these uh, prisoners. And due to the ever-increasing terror imposed by the occupant in 1942, they established another very important organization that we need to mention that is the organization of special combat operations the osa and uh, the osa was a, a part of the home army as well and uh, that particular unit was responsible for the third form of uh, armed struggle that is they were carrying out uh, attempts at the life of german officials uh, german commanders and gestapo agents Gestapo commanders and officers who were brutal, um, especially uh, brutal against the Poles, and also um, they were also punishing those uh, who committed the act of treason against uh, treason against the Polish underground state and the OSA unit in 1943. Was carried out number uh, carried out a number of such operations, and uh, it was. Uh, uh, taken uh, to the Kadev, and so it has become, it became another unit within the framework of the Kadev command that was uh, responsible for the uh, sabotage operations uh, on the territory of Poland. Um, and uh, perhaps you might, you, uh, you might think that you might have a question, why? if um, the home army had um, the um, armed forces units and they were active uh, until august 1944 that is until the time of the warsaw rising and um, they were carrying out diversion campaigns why were not fighting in an open field against the, the german invader and and also against the soviet invader well there was no such possibility to stage open uh, armed resistance and the conditions of carrying out struggle by the resistance movement of the Polish underground state. Those, uh, those conditions and forms of struggle were adjusted to the current situation in the occupied territories by the Germans, that is the general government, and also in the territories uh, annexed uh, to the Third Reich, that is uh, the Banks of Pomerania area. And uh, until that time, there was no possibility of uh, developing a strong in the half um, 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 possibility to carry out open generally general armed uh, um, operations against uh, the uh, German invader. Therefore, they were preparing for several years and uh, we saw that uh, first on the 1st of uh, August 1944 when within the framework of the Buja operation the Warsaw Rising started 
of which we shall speak more soon. Now, as far as uh, sabotage operations are concerned, that was uh, one of the forms of struggle. And um, uh, Stefan Rovetsky Grot uh, was uh, managing uh, those um, um, operations and uh, General Grot uh, issued an order to establish uh, the um, uh, established uh, uh, to establish the Zvyanzak Odveto unit uh, that is uh, the combat unit responsible for retaliation, unit of retaliations, and this is to provide uh, to endanger the economy of the German Reich in the Polish territory, to break the spirit of the German spirit and maintaining by, through active um, action, patriotic uh, uh, attitude of um, the population and also disrupting lines of uh, supplies uh, to the Germans and uh, lines of supplies uh, of, of supplying them with foods and resources. So as far as, um, um, for instance, uh, the uh, Venets operation was uh, carried out, that was one of the examples of the operations of the Union of Retaliation. This is when they uh, struck against the German railway lines that was on the railway lane from Okinawa to Warsaw. And in October 1942, within the framework of the operation with the code name Venets, this uh, operation was arranged and um, um, executed by the Home Army units. And here we, uh, and here I quote again uh, the explosions damaged the railway lines taken to Kolushki, Milkini, Lublin, and for many hours the railway node was incapacitated. Therefore, the, the movement and transport of any goods and resources was no longer possible. That was um, important from the point of view of logistic supplies for the Germans. And this is how they have been capable of um, diminishing uh, the combat capabilities of the German army. So we need to remember about it first, that was a very highly successful operation, but too, unfortunately, because, and I'm saying unfortunately, because uh, um, uh, dozens of uh, soldiers died. And um, we know that um, the Germans uh, executed 50 people without any honor who, who at that time were being imprisoned. And so the German retaliation of the 16th of October 1944 meant that on five gallows they hanged um, they're actually in the proximity of the Venice operation that is uh, at the Wolle in Szczyszlewice, in Pilsowiczny, in Marke, and in Robertov they hanged 50 Poles who at that time were imprisoned. And here I touch upon a very important problem. I was asked to make you familiar with that during the lecture today. The struggle in the structures of the Polish military arm of the fighting Poland, Polska Walczonca, was an expression of extraordinary courage. People realized that it costs or may cost death when swearing in soldiers of the home army particularly well realized what the risk was. Nevertheless, the Polish resistance was such a mass movement. I've already mentioned that just 1944 meant 350,000 soldiers sworn in into home army, despite that awareness of what Germans can do with the people arrested during that fight. You also risked dying in battle, but that was something that Germans perpetrated. These were crimes, like the crime that I've just mentioned. You could be murdered even when you were a representative of the Polish army, soldiers of the Polish army were members of a legal army which responded to the Polish government in exile and all the armies are protected by appropriate conventions, soldiers mustn't be murdered and Germans would not respect that. 
Another example, I believe it's important and highly significant, even though it concerns just one person. I'd like to mention 1940 and Agnieszka Dobor Muśnicka, daughter of a Polish general who was in the underground structures in Warsaw, in Wilki, that is the Wolves organization. In February, she was arrested by Germans. And despite being a woman, in 1940, she was murdered in Palmyra by Germans. That was even more hurtful if we realize that in April 1940, Agnieszka's sister, Janina Ney Dovbur-Muśnicka Lewandowska was her married name, arrested by the Soviets in 19, back in 1939, was murdered in April 1940 in Katyn. So these two deaths are just two months apart. Two brave sisters fighting for the independence of the Polish state against Soviets and against Germans. The military campaigns of the Polish resistance organized as part of those uh, military arm. One of the most famous actions related to the liquidation of the murderers of the Polish nation, which was the assassination of Hans Kuchera, who was the SS leader for the Warsaw district of the general government, the central and southern part of Poland. It's worth mentioning general government were the lands that the Germans occupied a particular uh, availability of uh, labor, unlike the rest of the Polish lands, which were made into German lands, into Reich. The assassination of uh, Kuchera was a work of uh, Kediv, that's the um, the reason was the terror that Kuchera introduced. This terror was visible in many uh, wapanki. Wapanka is a holdup in the street, and it's a very colloquial name on the Polish side. And it was just grabbing hundreds of unexpected people and in the street and taking them to the um, concentration camps and make force them to uh, force them to uh, force labor. Kuchera was also responsible for mass executions in Warsaw and this action was entrusted to the head of director of diversion, that's Kediv. Um, its head was Nil. The execution was in Aleja Ujazdowskie Street in front of the villa where that was the seat, the home to him. That was a successful attack. In its result, uh, Kuchera finally died. And that attack ended in German retaliation. Germans on the following day, murdered 100 Polish people, just like in case of Wieniec, close to the same building where the attack took place, more people were murdered in the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto. And a huge contribution was laid on Warsaw and the neighboring uh, communes. A lot of money had to be paid. In January 1943, uh, they ran a campaign which resulted in arresting three officers of the Home Army and then they were to be liberated. One of the Cichociemi, I will explain who they were, had to conduct it. He was called Ponore. Uh, Cichociemi, the quiet and dark, were paratroopers who were uh, dropped in Poland, but previously trained in the United Kingdom. 
they were to support the local uh, armed forces. After reaching this place, one of the cars drove to the gate of the German uh, prison. The action was very well thought and uh, they used German and they were dressed in the SS uh, uniforms. So their action was to uh, show or to prove that it was not a campaign of the Polish underground. The uh, guerrillas managed to uh, climb one of the uh, watchtowers, attack the guards, and they locked in the German military police and evacuated the Polish soldiers by cars. In this way, that action lasted for around 30 minutes and it became a standard training material for the Polish um, attack groups. Their following one, Gural, um, was connected to the need to provide the uh, Polish Home Army with money. It cost to gain weapons and they decided they would do it from the pocket of the German occupier and in 43 one of the head of uh, units um, managed to take control of a German car with money. It was called Action Goral and is considered one of the most important armed actions and the name makes reference to the 500 zloty banknote called Goral Highlander. It was one that was most easily found in the bags of money. It took more than a year to prepare that raid and uh, involved cooperation with the staff of the bank who informed about changes in the methods of protecting the money. So the preparations were very long and the raid was absolutely perfect, which was successful. Germans were convinced that these were bandits and they did not decide to retaliate against civilians. Only posters were hung up that for finding the criminals, one million zloty would be paid. And the answer from the Home Army was immediate because uh, the some bits of paper were added to it saying that we will uh, give 10 million to the next person uh, showing us or naming such a transport. The following campaign organized in Poland by the uh, Polish resistance because the Polish armed forces had far broader reach and they also operated in the West as part of operation of different armies with generals. The Home Army operated in Poland and the Home Army was also responsible for participation in this uprising, which was supposed to be organized as, as a moving zone, a moving belt, while the Soviet armies would enter Poland. Uh, the situation was quite complicated. I'll try to make myself clear. Since 1941, from the moment when Hitler attacked Stalin, Soviet Union entered the Allied forces. It was not part of it in 1939-41 because then it allied with Hitler. It was only after Hitler's attack on his previous ally that the that Stalin joined uh, the Western alliance and Poland found itself in quite a tragic situation because one of the occupiers of Poland from day to day joined the allied forces which Poland was part of from the first days of the Second World War. Now forcing back Germans beginning with 1944 going 
east towards Berlin, the Soviet army began to enter the pre-war Polish land. Soldiers of the Home Army were given the task. On the one hand, together with the Soviet armies, the same armies that on the 17th September invaded Poland, they were to win over the Polish cities. I mean Lviv, I mean Vilnius, they were uh, retaking them from the hands of the Germans. On the other hand, soldiers of the Home Army were to uh, present the civilian and military uh, structures. Those authorities that operated here in the Polish lands, I discussed it earlier from the moment when they started building the structures of the underground state. That was a tragical moment because eager to welcome the occupier as host in our homeland, we were disclosing to them, to those who occupied those lands from 39 to 41 and who then became allies, we disclosed to them our military and civilian structures to emphasize that these uh, lands, that this house are parts of the Polish state. However, Soviets, just like Germans, acting absolutely against any principles of honor, would then arrest those soldiers. Some of them were murdered, others were exiled to Siberia, and there was absolutely no respect of for what the soldiers of the Home Army did during the Second World War, fighting against the German uh, occupier. The most glaring case of that, and now let me move to 1945, was the Soviets uh, capturing uh, and abducting representatives of the Polish underground state, taking them to Moscow, where in June 45, they were judged. I mean here, for example, I'm talking about the Polish resistance. Let me name just one of the 16 people who were court-martialed in the drum court in Moscow and who were before members of the Polish underground state. I mean, General Okulitsky Nomdega Nijviadek, who was um, the commander in chief of the Home Army. And this is how the Soviets were treating the legal representatives of the uh, Polish uh, um, uh, underground state uh, that was um, carrying out armed struggle against the Germans. Uh, they considered they wanted to. And this is uh, how they decided to invite Poland and to impose the communist government by using their representatives. But they took a decision to get rid of, the, to get rid of those who were developing the structures of the Polish underground state. And so they decided to, uh, to liquidate uh, the uh, top representatives, the, the chief commanders uh, and the delegates of, uh, of the uh, government of the Republic of Poland, and also they were uh, prosecuting those soldiers of the Home Army who uh, fought uh, within the uh, s uh, the structures of the Cadet General Neil was uh, first not recognized by the communists, but later on, once he took a decision uh, to stand out because he was a man of honor and he believed uh, that uh, just uh, presenting himself um, uh, to the communist leaders would mean that he believed that he would not be imprisoned. Uh, but the General Neil, after World War II, um, uh, was uh, trying to act openly after war, uh, but he was arrested and uh, he was um, being forced, uh, he was being forced uh, to um, act as a traitor. He refused uh, and then uh, he was sentenced to death and he was uh, fired by the, uh, he, he, he was, uh, um, um, uh, General Neil was hanged, not executed by the firing squad. The firing squad was meant to, for the armed officers, but he was hanged as not an officer. And um, in fact, uh, just the regular criminals were hanged to not executed by the firing squad. And this is how they 
wanted to, uh, they treated him. And uh, it was after World War II. And uh, regardless, despite uh, his immense contribution um, uh, and uh, also the, so the immense contribution of the Polish Home Army soldiers in their contribution in their armed struggle against the Nazi invaders, this is how they were treated by the communists in Poland, in our country without any social legitimacy because no such legitimacy was had, had ever been given to the communists There's no elections were had been held and so they were all uh, performing the orders issued by stalin and as far as uh, the repressions against the civil, uh, civilian population is concerned uh, such repressions uh, i have already spoke about the repressions uh, carried out by the germans uh, but the so-called pacification actions that were carried out by the German invader. And the, uh, such pacification campaigns were carried out not only against the prisoners, and the prisoners were kept, were held um, in German um, torture uh, cells, uh, but uh, also uh, those were campaigns against the residents of um, just places and the villages. How, uh, for instance, Michnyov, uh, it's the village that was pacified, that is, uh, was burnt down. Um, and um, was um, completely destroyed. Um, the Germans were killing women and children as well. So the invaders' terror, it's a separate topic uh, that uh, needs um, a separate meeting with you, but that uh, was the mass scale terror exercised by the Germans in the Polish territories. The Germans killed approximately 6 million citizens of Poland. If we were to translate that, into the relative values that would mean approximately 18 percent of the pre-war polish society 18 percent of the polish society as at um, uh, september 1939 were murdered until 1945. ladies and gentlemen i also would like to recommend um, the um, reading of uh, more literature of course 40 minutes of a meeting is uh, not enough uh, to speak about all of uh, the uh, topics related to the Polish resistance but I do recommend the reading of uh, well if you are interested of course by the books by Jan Karski story of our secret state this is uh, the book of an outstanding, prominent Polish envoy, Jan Karski. Um, Jan Kozlewski was translated into the Polish language as the secret state in the Polish language. And uh, one should also read uh, Stefan Grabunski's book uh, under the title, The Polish Underground State, uh, a guide to the underground in the period 1939 to 1945. And, eventually finally it's worth reaching out to the monumental book that um, lists um, a wealth of resources that is a book called the home army in documents Armia Krajowa it's five volumes it's an immense publication and um, it also quotes source materials uh, the source material that is devoted to this particular topic, that is the topic of um, the armed struggle of the Home Army for the independence of the Republic of Poland. Me, as a representative of the Museum World World War II, um, would like to invite you to visit to the main exhibition at the World War II Museum in Banks. And um, it is um, a very telling exhibition that also uh, shows you the exhibits and uh, the items uh, um, and objects that come that originate from those times that I have been telling about and uh, if you find time uh, please visit the museum because it will um, also satisfy your interest and uh, your needs uh, uh, for knowledge uh, about the activities of the Polish Home Army and the uh, armed struggle. So the Home Army, the, that is the military branch of the Polish underground state, is the Polish Army that um, was um, operating um, incredibly well um, 
deserves uh, high esteem for their operations carried out not only in the Polish territories but also but also against the background of other European resistance movements and the activities of the Polish underground states uh, were remarkably unprecedented. No, uh, no other country had a, a state like of the kind. So these two elements already show how Polish experience within uh, the uh, how important is the experience of Poland during World War II and um, how much was done by the Polish underground state that, that made a big difference, especially in the context of the uh, German invasion of the territory of Poland and uh, also when compared with other territories occupied by the Germans during World War II. And uh, the more respect we owe to all those soldiers of the Home Army who were fighting with um, a free and independent Poland in their hearts. And this is how we were so grateful and very proud of them for their armed resistance. And here at the very end, I would like to mention something that uh, I spoke about at the very beginning of uh, my lecture. It is very important to nourish independence related traditions. Uh, independence is the reference point for us as for the people who are interested in learning about the past. So as um, something result, important results uh, from that past for our modern days. Uh, I apologize for speaking a bit longer than expected, but, I, but this is what I could say in the nutshell. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to take part in this meeting. Thank you. It's a fascinating, uh, fascinating lecture. Um, And I'm uh, convinced that, that um, our um, students have learned a lot and it will help them in their research activities uh, that uh, are very important uh, in their GCSC projects. We have a question on chat, if I may read it out as a moderator. The largest uh, guerrilla uh, for battles in the Polish territories, if you could speak about guerrilla warfare, please, as well. Yes, yes, I heard the question. Yes, the guerrilla warfare in the Polish territories. I spoke about the Bucha operation that led to the liberation of a number of Polish towns. The Tempest operation uh, that was uh, quite a very strong beginning of the activities of the home army soldiers and uh, um, Polish uh, towns were being liberated by the Polish soldiers. I'm losing sound, I apologize, no sound, no interpretation. I apologize, uh, the quality of sound renders interpreting impossible. Apologize, but the uh, quality of sound uh, renders interpretation not possible. I'm losing every um, couple of phrases. I apologize, but in, I will resume interpretation whenever that is possible. I do not uh, see any more questions. So, Veronika, could you please double check any more uh, queries on the chat? No, uh, there are no more questions to doctor on the chat. 
Thank you. I think that's been a fascinating lecture, and uh, I think uh, it was a great uh, skill of listening skill, of listening skill at a high level. Uh, many great uh, facts, uh, many facts are known for, to us, uh, but also it shows that it's important to maintain the independent spirit within us, to nourish it. And we were celebrating on the 11th of November, and we were celebrating that holiday for us, the Poles. And this is, in fact, uh, the um, that is the result of all those uh, battles fought with valor. I would like to thank the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation for organizing this meeting for cooperation. And I hope that we will be, uh, will have a possibility to meet yet again. And I would like to thank all the students and schools who wanted to stay with us this morning and to learn more this morning together with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking part in this meeting and would like to invite you to other events organized by the Seeds of History 2.0 Knowledge of Seeds of uh, uh, Knowledge and to, today we are going to have another meeting at 7 p.m. by um, Professor Hvalbam um, entitled From the Halle Army to the Kostyushka Army, the meeting is organized by the Polish American Social Club of Las Vegas. I encourage you to follow our social media. So please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you very much and goodbye. If I may apologize, there is a question on the chat. I don't know if everyone sees, there is actually a question. And can we ask a question still? Veronika, you, I don't know who asked that question, but I don't see any question on the chat. It's just a request to, but could you please write your question on the chat? So whoever is the author of this post, if you can ask a question, please ask a question. Just, uh, just write the question, please. Okay, we'll wait um, for 10 to 15 seconds. So please post your question. Yes, we can see something. It's to you, doctor. Please say something more about the... Uh, role of soldiers of the home army in Stalinist time and about their martyrdom. That's a very long answer. Many of the soldiers of the home army who fought with the German occupier, they entered the new anti-communist structures. That's NIE, that was a cryptonym for NIE Podległość, independence and also the uh, delegation of the armed forces to Poland, which being liquidated, changed into a new structure, which was the freedom and independence, Wolność i Niezawisłość. They had their origin in the home army, and to a great extent, they used the soldiers of the home army. And nonetheless, they were of entirely different nature when it comes to the methods of fighting with the new invader that was civilian fight due to the excessive force of the Soviet um, to the Soviet uh, invader they were brutally pacified by the internal core, by the Polish army, structures of the police, thousands of people who fought the Polish. They died in war, they died fighting, and also in places of martyrdom, which were throughout the country. There was the there were the agendas in the counties. These were the offices of public security, and in all those places, one of the fundamental orders of those structures was catching people who, in 1945, recognized quite correctly that the fight for independence did not end for the Polish state. Nevertheless, no armed struggle stood an opportunity of success. You needed different 
methods. And Wolność i Niezawisłość, that's freedom and independence, had individual directorates. There were four of those. And the last main board of this organization was under the helm of Łukasz Ciepliński. I mentioned that name for a purpose. He was a figure and a symbol of heroism, courage, daring, of never yielding principles, even in extreme situations. He was very brutally tortured, like um, cavalry captain uh, Pilecki and many tens of other people. Pilecki compared the uh, Soviet prison to Auschwitz. And speaking of Auschwitz, he said that comparing it to this, Auschwitz was a plaything. Returning to Ciplinski, Ciplinski was murdered together with representatives of the fourth main board on the 1st March 1951 with a shot to the back of the head in the uh, in, in one of those centers. He was then buried in an anonymous pit. Łukasz Cieplinski and hundreds of other Polish underground and resistance uh, people were murdered doubly. One physical, a shot to the back of the head, just like Polish citizens were murdered in cutting in other places of martyrdom. That was a particular point of reference in this murdering spree. And uh, this was done by representatives of Stalin in Poland. They used the shot to the back of the head and they did not inform the family about the place of burial of Polish independence fighters. The martyrdom of Polish soldiers fighting for Polish independence after the war is one of the key elements of building our identity in the capacity of people who remember those who fought for our independence in the new reality. The Second World War and the Stalinist reality following it immediately was the time of breaking the backbone, a stage in breaking the backbone of the Polish society who had all the rights also for its heroic attitude in resisting Germans and Soviets to feel the victors building and having an option to build an independent Polish state. And people like Pilecki, like Zygmunt Szendzielas, like Łukasz Cieplinski and many others, hundreds and thousands of people who never laid down the weapons after the war and who by different methods would build the Polish independence. Again, they did it in the circumstances of no hope at all. In 1940, they could not achieve any success. Let me emphasize, they built our sense of pride of having roots in uh, Poland, that our history is like this, not like anything else, and that in our history we can find those who would find that spirit that let them go on and fight or go into the fight. Thank you very much for those words. Imagine that we've got more things on the chat. We are more active. You mentioned Pilecki and there are comments in the chat. We went to a monodrama about uh, Captain Pilecki, Melduje Tobie Polsko. A question of you could add a few words about him. I understand that you added some 
content and there's one more question from the point of view of our research project important could you please suggest some websites some sources that our students could use to gain interesting information to, to expand their um, research projects thank you just let me make sure i'm very sorry i cannot hear I believe that it would be good to mention sources of two types, both online. Well, also source materials which you used using your um, research for this presentation. In reference to Captain Witold Pilecki, I can't miss to mentioned that he is the patron of the mission of the of our museum a monument to him is in front of the main entry to the uh, museum and speaking of the details of his bio let me reiterate that's another subject that does deserve a separate meeting as i hear there was a meeting like that a week ago and i'm very glad the symbolism of the monument. Witold Pilecki is here in the uniform of a Polish soldier. And this is a monument of oversize of over two meters. He is walking on the edge. It's a symbolic edge of life and death. He always balanced on that edge. Apart from this happy period when he was a happy husband, father, artist, host, he always walked on the edge of life and death, speaking of the risk and I'm talking here about the Polish Bolshevik war, about the underground operation before he joined the structures of the union of armed struggle and then he decided to enter auschwitz of his own will in 1943 why to develop a underground army there and on the other hand to document the German, sorry, I don't use these words often, but for Auschwitz, I have to say bestiality that Germans perpetrated for many, many years. And our cavalry captain Pilecki would not hesitate to take that step. He fulfilled his mission in Auschwitz and in spring of 43, when he escaped from Auschwitz, when uh, it was only when no other inmates would be killed for the escape of one. So that edge was visible then. At that time, he went on to fight in the structures of the Home Army. He participated in the Warsaw Uprising. Then, for some time, he was a prisoner of German camps already in the structures of the army of General uh, Władysław Anders, he took a decision to return to uh, his, our homeland in thrall of the communists. And he returned here to run uh, intelligence, to document like he did in Auschwitz, but in Auschwitz, he documented the German crimes. Here he documented what soviets were doing here what people of stalin were doing and that risk balancing on the edge of death and life it's always something that serves the good of the republic of poland in our monument in one hand pilecki is holding in this gesture of rejection and throwing behind him the auschwitz uh, cap and in the other hand that shows forward 
he shows that he's going into new fight. Thus, Witold Pilecki is a person who is exceptional worldwide, and I don't hesitate to use that phrase when we speak of the unique courage and daring fighting for the Polish state in circumstances that would seem absolutely hopeless. That shows that we may have different fears about what may happen to us. That goal that we want to have, that we want to achieve, the goal, the purpose that in this case we recognize the most important that concerns the Republic of Poland, it will always justify, it will always help us break our internal doubts, overstep those barriers and enter a reality of higher values. In case of um, Cavalry Captain Pilecki, all our hearts just are addressed to him when we think about the place where his mortal remains are. We hope they will be successfully found and identified and perhaps together we will be able to participate in a joint state funeral of Rotmistrz Pilecki. I hope that this will happen because this is a highly symbolic figure for the existence of the Polish state. That is something that I really wish to myself, to you and to the whole Republic of Poland, that we may find our great hero and that we may give him a honest farewell. We talked about returning dignity to Polish heroes so that it may be a dignified funeral. I want to, to emphasize it. I have no doubt and I've never had any doubt that communists were not capable. Those who tortured them and mm, murdered them, they were never able of taking away the dignity from them. Now the Polish state returns to its heroes, to the places where they are waiting for this action of the Polish state. That process will never end until the Republic has found the last of its heroes who were treated like that by those who were unable to act in honor. Speaking of the sources, there is um, a wealth of material and one should uh, reach out to the collection of the documents under the title Armia Krev of Dokumentach, which is the Home Army Documents, five volumes uh, with very detailed content with, uh, with references, with uh, specialist comments that show the evolution of uh, the Home Army uh, and it, they show many different stages of the development of that armed structure. Therefore, I would uh, recommend that book, but also Ney Krvavich books, uh, um, also very good uh, as far as the Home Army is concerned, but to also meet the needs uh, of uh, the audience. I declare that on Monday, I will send uh, I will send to uh, Mrs. Uh, Monica Gabinska uh, an email with a list of literature of uh, books uh, that are most interesting from my point of view. I would also recommend a number of uh, web pages to have a look at uh, within the framework of your project. Before noon, you will have that email ready. Yes, I think that this is going to be the best option to send a list by email. We'll send it out to schools um, with the aid of uh, Mrs. Veronica. Thank you very much. And we have received, as a, uh, as a trailer, we already received a book from the Foundation in the English uh, language, Encountering Cutting. And so we are going to distribute this book as well. So I'm addressing these words to the principals and teachers of the Polish schools. You will soon have this book in the English language and it uh, shall make it easier for us to understand 
um, this knowledge because we're addressing this knowledge to our children who in many cases were born in the UK. Therefore, perhaps uh, it is uh, somewhat easier for them to read in English. And there is one more question. Although I do not know who, uh, who is the addressee of this uh, question, perhaps uh, the uh, the comment is that um, uh, Captain Pilatsky is uh, known very well around the world, but also in the United Kingdom. And what do you do, you meaning the foundation, to disseminate this knowledge? But even today's meeting is a good example of um, this um, activity and um, the topics that are uh, selected by students uh, during high level exams uh, they're usually uh, interested in the resistance and in the underground state so this is already a motivating factor uh, for them uh, to deepen their knowledge on the underground state and the resistance uh, I don't know, perhaps doctor would like to add anything to that because this was uh, quite a general question perhaps addressed to the many. I apologize, the sound is not even, interpretation not possible. A request to improve the sound. I apologize, interpreting not possible, lost sound. Myślę, że to założenie symboliczne pomnika ono również przyciąga uwagę. Nikt, kto wchodzi do Muzeum II wojny światowej, nie może, minu, nie, nie może nie minąć tego pomnika. W związku z tym, w związku z tym Witold Pilecki jest taką osobą, która patronuje. Witold Pilecki jest the patron of the mission of the Museum of World War II. He is monument standing right in front of the entrance to the museum. It's a monumental. Um, uh, uh, statue. So this is how we are also trying to address attention to the significance of this person for the Polish history and for the mission that has been um, executed by the World War II Museum. But uh, also in our museum cinema, we are soon going uh, to hold a number of lectures together with the presentation or with the screening of the newest uh, uh, film about um, uh, Captain Pilecki. The, it's a really short uh, video material presenting him, but um, nonetheless, um, it's a very interesting um, production. And um, undoubtedly, this uh, film has been done in a very interesting way. So, Captain Pilecki is also present at our internet web pages. I'm talking about um, our main web page and home page and also um, at, on our Facebook profile. So we always speak of him. And Vitor Pilecki is a very important part of the main exhibition. As there, we also have uh, special uh, pictures of uh, 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 Captain uh, Pilecki and also there is a multimedia stand that speaks uh, about him in the English language, but also in the Polish language. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I understand that uh, you are, are having yet another meeting ahead of us, so I'm not going, uh, so no more messages on the chat. But once again, thank you very, very much for the fantastic, fascinating lecture and very patriotic from the point of view of us who live in the emigration, as it reminds us so who we are. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation. I don't know if Varenika is going to say anything at the end. I would like to thank all the Polish schools. I would like to say that we, uh, some uh, classes had to disconnect due to their classes, uh, but it's just, but most of us are still here. So it shows uh, that this has been a great meeting. I would like to thank you on behalf of the Polish Educational Society. Thank you very much and goodbye. 
Thank you. I would like to thank for the questions on the chat. I'm very happy that the children have joined us and, uh, and the youth have joined and uh, do follow us on our uh, social media. See you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye.